All right, so welcome back to The Young Idealist and my ongoing series on classical German philosophy, German romanticism. And today I have a, a little treat for everyone. Um, I have brought in Dr. Matthew D. Siegel to speak about uh, Rudolf Steiner. And Matt has been talking to me about Steiner and why Steiner has been important in the history of German idealism for a while. And so I thought of inviting um, Dr. Siegel here today to speak about the life and philosophy and relation that Steiner has, and I guess an anthroposophy has to idealism and romanticism. So just for the viewers and for Matt, this series, my digital archive on this, is meant to, in a sense, harness the spirit of Brian McGee's old great philosopher series where I sit down with a thinker and I engage with a thinker, an interlocutor. We hear about the philosopher's biography, their philosophy, and we, we create a conversation that is both for enthusiasts, scholars, and of course, students. So Matthew D. Siegel is an associate professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the Department of Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness, and in the School of Consciousness and Transformation. His areas of specialization are process philosophy, German idealism, psychedelic studies, philosophy of mind, philosophy of nature, and philosophy of religion. Dr. Siegel is a transdisciplinary researcher who teaches courses applying process relational um, philosophy across various disciplines, including religious studies, philosophy of nature, philosophy of mind, and social and political theory. He has published on these and a wide range of other topics, including German idealism, philosophy of time, psychedelics, theoretical biology, architecture, and media theory, and has been on YouTube for almost 20 years. And I can also say, from knowing Matt, for quite a while now, Matt also engages in very, very interesting dialogues with scientists, biologists, um, and I will link all of his work um, in the description under the, the, the episode for today. I'm struggling here. I've only had one coffee. So without further ado, again, I'm welcoming um, Dr. Siegel to The Young Idealist. Thank you so much for being here. So good to be in dialogue with friends. Uh, Chris, thanks for having me on. Really um, grateful to you for this Young Idealist uh, channel and the interviews that you've you've put online. For those of us who are scholars of German idealism, or and I know for many students, uh, it's such an uh, important resource. So yeah, happy to be here to continue. I just wish we were like in, in those McGee interviews, sitting on a couch together uh, and chatting <laughs> instead of on Zoom here, but we'll make do. Yes. Me too, me too. I wish I was in sunny California as well, too, instead of rainy Toronto. Yeah. So perhaps you can start us off by explaining who was Rudolf Steiner and why do you think his thought is important today? Hmm. So Rudolf Steiner uh, was born in 1861. Uh, happens to be the same year that my other uh, one of my other philosophical heroes, Alfred North Whitehead, was born. Uh, but Steiner's born in what is was then Austria-Hungary um, and is today Croatia. And, um, you know, it was growing up in a time when the Industrial Revolution uh, was just getting into, into Central Europe in a big way. And his father worked at the local uh, railway station. And Steiner took an early interest in science and technology as a result of his father's work. Um, but also from a very young age had parapsychological uh, experiences. Um, he reports in his uh, autobiography that um, when he was, I don't know, seven or eight years old, uh, he saw an apparition of what turned out to be a family member, his aunt, I think, who had just committed suicide and um, continued uh, throughout his life to have these weird uh, clairvoyant experiences, right? So he's got that spiritual side going on, but then he's also got this very intellectual, um, scientifically grounded side going on. And so he would go and study at a, a technical college. Um, he ended up writing his dissertation on uh, Johann Gottlieb uh, Fichte and was quite taken by the uh, intellectual intuition of 
of the self or the eek that uh, Fichte so brilliantly articulated. But at the same time, he's also a deep student of um, uh, Goethe's work um, and actually edits Goethe's scientific work uh, in the 1880s and 90s, uh, the official sort of German um, edition, five volumes it ended up being by the time he finished uh, introducing and editing them. And so he's also quite enraptured by Goethe's image of nature uh, and by Goethe's method of um, sort of a phenomenological participatory way of coming into a loving relationship to uh, plants and their processes of growth and metamorphosis or to color. Uh, you know, Goethe was involved in quite a uh, polemic with the Newtonians and their understanding of color. And so Steiner really sees uh, the Goethean method of science as a a new non-dualistic way of uh, coming to know the natural world. But he's also got this Fichtean side uh, where he's aware of the power of our own self-consciousness and our freedom. Uh, and so he's really trying to hold these two poles together. Um, so by the end of the 19th century, uh, he's he had been teaching as a sort of private tutor for some families in Vienna, I believe. And then he moves to Berlin and he's active as an editor of various magazines uh, involved in the political controversies of the day, um, very interested in the arts. You know, he's at uh, the coffee houses and uh, debating with um, major, uh, uh, you know, political and philosophical figures. Uh, in the first several years of the 20th century, I think until 1904, he's teaching at a workers college in Berlin. Um, and so, you know, just as he grew up in that working class context, he knows uh, the plight of the workers um, at that time and is is trying to engage in enlivening the cultural life of the working class. Um, but also around this time, he, he joins the Theosophical Society because again, he has this other uh, spiritual side of his life that up until that point, he had remained pretty quiet about. Um, he becomes the secretary of the German section of the Theosophical Society and continues to lecture for about 10 years um, for the Theosophical Society in Germany. But gradually, as the Theosophical Society um, turns more to um, Indian thought, and eventually, I think in 1911, uh, the leadership of the Theosophical Society declared that uh, this young boy, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who would go on to become quite a well-known spiritual teacher, they declared him the second coming of Christ, and that was the last straw for Steiner. Uh, he had already been um, more of a, he was more in the Rosicrucian stream, this Western esoteric stream, um, and the Theosophical Society had always been more Eastern in its focus, and Steiner's very open to uh, Vedic thought and Buddhism and all of that, but he's a Christian at heart, and when they declared Krishnamurti uh, the second coming, Steiner had had enough, so he leaves the Theosophical Society, and he founds the Anthroposophical Society, and um, would continue sort of building that uh, as his hub for a new approach to natural science, but also a new understanding of what he would call spiritual science, which is the study of the way in which um, the human spirit is in some deep resonance with uh, the spirit of the cosmos. And so it's an understanding of the human being as a microcosm in a sense. Uh, and he made contributions not only to education through Waldorf schools, which I believe are the largest private school, uh, is the largest private school movement in the world right now, biodynamic agriculture. He made contributions to uh, medicine, uh, to the arts, um, and so many other areas. There's almost nothing he didn't lecture on um, at some point. Uh, he had made the headquarters of Anthroposophy in Dornach, Switzerland, and built their uh, this cathedral-like structure called the Gertianum. The first one was actually, just as it was finished, it was beautiful wood carved, a domed structure uh, built by people from all over Europe during World War I when the people uh, who were working on it, their countries were at war with each other, but they're here together in neutral Switzerland building this new spiritual community. But unfortunately in 1922, actually New Year's Eve 1922, um, 
through to the next day, the 1st of January, 23, the building burned down. Um, some suspect it was arson. Um, and then soon after that, uh, Steiner gets sick. Um, some think he was poisoned. Um, he was in, he was battling a bit with uh, the Nazi movement, the early Nazi movement at this time. He was, he was a part of a, a social movement called Social Threefolding. And Hitler named Steiner, actually, in a newspaper article in 1922, I believe, um, attacking him. And so there's some speculation he was poisoned by uh, members of the early Nazi party. But anyways, he dies in March of 1925. The anthroposophical movement continued, continues to this day. They rebuilt a new Gartianum. It's a giant... Uh, cast concrete structure now looks more like a fortress than the original because you know there was he was an anthroposophy became a bit embattled at that time um and so he's continues to be this this figure who um is quite influential but also quite controversial because he makes claims um both about the natural sciences and the ways in which a materialist approach to science goes wrong and also he he has this whole spiritual worldview uh, that you know draws on uh, sort of the these angelic hierarchies that Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite uh, would articulate in his account of the celestial hierarchies, and he evolutionizes that picture. So you get this understanding of an evolutionary cosmology um, that is in constant dialogue with these spiritual beings that are involved at different stages of this evolution. So it's an interesting attempt to integrate. Uh, a really profound spirituality with natural science and the extent to which he strikes that balance again is a matter of controversy, but um, perhaps we can get into some of that. But just to follow up, if you don't mind, you had mm -hmm. brought up theosophy and parapsychology. Would you mind defining the two? Yeah. Um, parapsychology is just the study of, uh, I mean, sometimes it's called psi phenomena. Um, the, uh, Psychical Research Society started in the early 1900s. Um, people like William James were very involved in that. And it's the study of phenomena like um, clairvoyance, precognition, uh, telekinesis, all the things that don't fit into the normal naturalistic paradigm. But nonetheless, many people uh, report experiences of, of these sorts of things. And so there's a whole uh, branch of psychology, which you know, does have an academic presence, even if it's sometimes dismissed. Um, there's a large body of evidence and um, theoretical reflection uh, over the course of a century or so on this, um, this these phenomena. Um, Edward Kelly at the University of Virginia uh, is probably one of the most prominent figures who's currently working in this area. And um, I just had a conversation with him the other day. And so, you know, my hope would be that as we move towards a less reductionistic, materialistic understanding of the human psyche and of the universe, that what is considered parapsychological now will just be normal psychology. Um, but uh, we're not quite there yet, right? And so the ability of, um, you know, psychics to engage in uh, um, reading people and, you um, you know, phenomena like telepathy and synchronicity, like all of these things would fall into the category of, of parapsychology. Well, thank you for answering that question. And if we can now talk about Steiner's main philosophical influences and how do you see these influences employed in his um, philosophical and, and spiritual uh, work? Mm. So according to Steiner, he starts reading Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason when he's about 14 years old um, and struggles with this uh, argument that Kant has that there are limits to human knowledge. Um, that didn't sit well with Steiner. And he would continue his study of the post-Kantian idealist. Uh, as I mentioned, he ends up writing his dissertation on, on Fichte, um, he studies Schelling quite deeply, he studies Hegel, he studies Goethe. Uh, Novalis uh, is very important to him, uh, as is the whole romantic movement. And so I really see him continuing 
the dialectic, as it were, of of German idealism um, into the late 19th and early 20th centuries and trying to make, uh, to bring some of these insights into practical life, right? And so it was so, what's so remarkable about Steiner's career as a thinker is that he's not just a thinker. He's constantly being, uh, well, responding to requests from people in the Anthroposophical Society and elsewhere to give indications about some problem they're having, whether it's the farmers whose soil is becoming less fertile, uh, or, you know, he creates the Waldorf school movement in response to a request from factory workers at the Waldorf uh, cigarette factory in Stuttgart in 1919. Um, he's, he's always trying to bring these ideas down to earth and to show how uh, seemingly abstract, uh, you know, um, spiritual concepts can transform the world. And to the extent that so many of these movements that he initiated continue to this day to bear fruit, um, I think, you know, there's plenty of evidence that uh, he had some genuine insights there. Uh, Owen Barfield is a, was a 20th century um, anthroposophist and, and philosopher in his own right, uh, uh, British um, gentleman. Uh, his, he was uh, a barrister uh for his day job, but uh, wrote a lot of interesting books and tried to, in, in the same way that Coleridge was one of the early uh, thinkers to bring German idealism into the English language, I think of Barfield as bringing Steiner into the English language. And, you know, Barfield thinks of Steiner as basically uh, allowing romanticism to come of age, to mature. Some people might criticize uh, the original romantics as being a bit too withdrawn from the world, withdrawn from politics and society, going into the imagination and into poetry. And, uh, you know, we think of Hegel's critique of the beautiful soul and all of this. Steiner matures romanticism by reversing the vector and sort of bringing the imagination and intuition uh, to bear on the real world, on social and political questions, uh, on the medicine. I mean, Schelling was already quite interested in medicine, but um, education and educational reform. And so it's not that the romantics, some of them weren't already interested in this, uh, but I think Steiner really does uh, help show how romanticism remains relevant uh, in the 20th and, and on into the 21st century as a check to the predominantly sort of techno-scientific enlightenment spirit uh, of our of our current civilization. Um, and, you know, things are changing in the last couple of decades, you know, uh, gone are the days when this sort of uh, Francis Fukuyama thesis about the end of history and democracy and capitalism and technology ridding the world of religion and uh, nobody thinks that anymore. And so the romantics attempt to sort of balance out this overly rationalistic approach uh, with emotion and imagination, I think, is increasingly relevant because if we don't have a, you know, a kind of method for exploring this power of imagination, uh, I think one of the consequences of not attending to this imaginal ground of human consciousness is conspiratorial thinking and everything sort of running off the rails culturally. We need to take imagination seriously and take a kind of scientific attitude towards the deep unconscious and the creative power and intuition that springs out of the depths of the human soul. Otherwise, yeah, things just go haywire, um, right? So I think Steiner provides us a way of uh, both taking natural science seriously, though if he would want us to take a more phenomenological Gertian approach to the observation of nature. Um, and he allows us to integrate that with this deeper spiritual longing uh, the human beings feel to be part of um, a meaningful, uh, you know, cosmic adventure of some kind and that our actions matter and that, you know, what we do as individuals in this life reverberates on into the future in some real sense. And Steiner is sort of trying to, um, I mentioned he's an esoteric Christian, he's in the Rosicrucian stream, and he wants to bring reincarnation and karma these ideas generally associated with Buddhism and, and 
uh, Hinduism and Eastern thought back into uh, Christianity and uh, Western spirituality. And the thing is, um, reincarnation is not that foreign uh, to ancient Judaism, to the church fathers like origin. He's talking about reincarnation, right? So it's not like Steiner's doing something totally out of the blue and weird by bringing reincarnation back. He's just trying to reestablish continuity with earlier understandings. Um, most people in the modern West might scoff at the idea of something like reincarnation, but the more I've sat with it, and I don't claim to remember past lives or anything like that, I don't generally find it very convincing when other people claim to be able to do that. But nonetheless, as a speculative exercise, when I think about ecological ethics, say, the idea that we that there's some continuity in the flow of life in this evolutionary process, that in some sense we were here before, not only with earlier generations of human beings, but perhaps with the whole uh, of the unfolding of life on this planet. And we will be here in the future to suffer the consequences of our uh, of our actions today uh, and our destruction of the planet. And so there's a deep, I think, ecological uh, ethos that would flow out of the uh, idea of reincarnation and taking that seriously. Nobody knows what happens after we die, but uh, I think in order to establish a real sense of um, interconnectivity between all beings that we share this planet with, it seems to me we should look again at this idea um, of reincarnation. And so that's just one of the gifts that he brings. Um, but so what I what I really enjoyed about your answer is the passion. You, you know, your mm -hmm. eyes light up when you talk about all of this stuff. And you you have an ally in me. I'm not a materialist. I, I think you you know that. And um, when we first met, I wasn't as I, I think I was quite dismissive of Steiner, and I'm opening up more to Steiner. And a lot of the a lot of the work that you're doing recently with philosophers and psychologists and physicists and kind of this interdisciplinary, you call it transdisciplinary. I like that idea of, of scholarship. You know, um, I think it's really interesting. I also think it's true through the, it's true to the heart of the late shelling, the kind of speculative philosophy, right? The metaphysical empiricism, especially in, when you, when you talk about James or, or um, Whitehead. So I want to thank you for such a rich answer. And I think you did a really great job of also bringing very relevant themes that are affecting us right now, especially, you know, um, uh, especially the, you know, conspiratory theories and, and just this kind of divide between left and right, the culture war. So I think you did a great job. And so mm -hmm. thank you so much for your answer. Could you explain for those who are not familiar with Steiner's uh, work, what is anthroposophy and how does anthroposophy differ from the traditional understanding of philosophy? So philosophy is usually considered to be a more or less intellectual exercise. Um, and Steiner is in no way um, inhibited in exploring the fruits of thinking activity, right? Uh, he's definitely uh, capable of, uh, you know, going toe to toe with uh, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, and and thinking with them. Um, but he's also a deep feeler, and uh, wants to again show how these ideas can be active in transforming the world, right? And so, for Steiner and for the anthroposophical. Uh, sort of point of view on these questions. The human being is not simply a thinking being, though our thinking is very important to Steiner. We're also feeling beings and willing beings. And philosophy, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, like Schelling, will is primal being or Schopenhauer, of course. Yeah, there, there are some extent to which philosophers concern themselves with the will. Uh, and romantic philosophers do concern themselves with feeling. But Steiner really wants to integrate these, and he wants to show how that the the sort of innate powers that that human beings are born with and just naturally develop uh, are not the end of human development. That we can actually continue to grow and uh, cultivate new organs of cognition, new soul powers, as it were. Right. So we all naturally have thinking, feeling, and willing. 
Anthroposophy provides a number of uh, practices, uh, meditation techniques that Steiner believes would help us cultivate some uh, further powers. He calls them imagination, inspiration, and intuition. And to some degree, you know, these are all already seated in each of us, but unless we as, um, as adults continue to engage life as a kind of learning process to develop our faculties, they won't flower. They'll just remain in seed form. And so Steiner felt that, um, you know, anthroposophy could provide the community and the, uh, the context wherein exercises that would guide the human being to the full flowering of uh, their spiritual potential. Um, and so, you know, in terms of imagination, um, you know, Steiner would say this is like the first power of, 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 of soul that we could develop that would be beyond our natural inborn abilities. Uh, it's the first level of spiritual cognition for him, you could say. And so imagination as a power of cognition, not just make believe and fantasy, but a, a way of knowing uh, would allow us to perceive what Steiner called the, the etheric dimension of nature. And so Steiner would say, you know, looking at say Goethe's study of plant metamorphosis, that when Goethe talks about the, the Erbpflanze, the archetypal plant, uh, what Goethe is really talking about is the etheric uh, formative power that underlies the visible plant. And it's a, uh, you could say it's like the, um, the time body of the plant, as it were, it's, it's the influence of, uh, it's for, it's formal causality, let's say, to put it in other terms. And Goethe developed a means of perceiving this by just patiently observing the growth of plants day after day after day. And so there's that time dimension to it, but he also travels down to Italy and sees how, oh, okay, the same species of plants do grow similar here, but different environment. They're slightly more adapted to their environment here in the, in the Mediterranean climate, but the same Erbpflanze is manifesting. And so Goethe for Steiner is really studying the etheric dimension of nature. And we can apply this insight across the biological world, but it requires our imagination in the sense that our physical eyes um, and our physical senses don't give us a perception of the underlying formative power. We need to participate at a deeper level and almost recreate the phases of the metamorphosis of the plant in our own imagination. Uh, and so there's a little bit of a, a callback to Aristotle's so-called contact epistemology. I think when you know the form of a thing, it's the same form in you that is manifest in the thing. Um, and so for Steiner, you know, we're really trying to go beyond what the physical senses can provide us. And it might seem like a very speculative idea, but you know, he'll bring home the the fact that there is an etheric dimension of nature by reminding us about the difference between a corpse and a living being. The moment someone dies, um, you know, I, I've I've been with uh, you know, grandparents who have passed away. I've been with uh I just had to put my dog to sleep a few months ago. And that transition from living body to corpse is quite striking. It's quite mysterious. What changes? As soon as the life leaves that body, it becomes uh, just dead matter and returns to the earth, right? And so our physical or our mineral bodies, as Steiner would say, are quite distinct from our living bodies. And that moment of death makes that quite clear. Um, and so anthroposophy is giving us this richer ontology, a kind of layered ontology where the physical is just the outer rind, as it were. And if you want to get to the fruit and and the the real core uh, of uh, the creative process that that unfolds, it's not that he says the physical is unreal. It's that it's a uh, it's sort of the outer expression, the outer shell of these deeper creative processes, the etheric. There's the astral as well, which is kind of like the soul dimension. And then there's the spirit, which uh, for Steiner is akin to the the eye. So when Fichte talks about this thinking activity, that's the spirit. The astral dimension for Steiner is more like what psychology studies. Um, the etheric body is is what we share with plants, 
uh, it's it's this vital dimension of our being. And then, of course, the mineral. And so anthroposophy is an attempt to integrate everything we know from physics about the physical world with these other dimensions uh, of of the universe, of the cosmos, and also to show how there's a correspondence between these organs of perception, imagination, inspiration, intuition that we can develop, and our capacity to then perceive and know something about these other dimensions of nature. Um, so, you know, for some, that's just several steps way too far. Uh, but I think for those who have studied German idealism, there's a way in which you can, uh, and romanticism, you know, make sense of what Steiner is suggesting, because so much of this is intimated already, you know, in Novalis's understanding of the imagination and so-called magical idealism. And it's like a, it's a making practical of some of these insights that might otherwise just remain uh, in the realm of fantasy, right? Steiner wants to apply them and show how they bear fruit. That was another um, fantastic answer. And I also think that romanticism gets a bit of a bad name. It, you know, it's always, it's always linked to, you know, the creation of some kind of fascistic state and not a lot of people look at how, how kind of revolutionary it was in the sense of attacking the kind of mechanism, the Cartesianism, you know, that Schelling talks about, and even Hegel talks about, well, Schelling talks about in the ideas where he says it's a spiritual sickness, um, in a sense. So I really like that you tied in all of this, and it seems like anthroposophy is, is it is speculative, a speculative science, but it's also a, a kind of, as you, as you brought up about yourself, a kind of transdisciplinary science, that's bringing in ontology, phenomenology, and all these others, you know, um, all these other great disciplines um, to think through things, which is, uh, uh, I think it's a fantastic um, philosophical endeavor. Yeah. Can I just say on that question of um, the association between romanticism and, and fascism, um, you know, in that famous document that's written in Hegel's handwriting, but that it seems like Schelling and, Hol and Holderlin also contributed to the oldest system program of German idealism. They say in there uh, that the ideal would be to shrink the state um, and uh, get rid of it ultimately, right? If you have truly free beings capable of this mutual recognition, uh, you don't need the state to violently enforce laws, you know? And so, um, Obviously, the story is uh, that as many of the romantics got older, and this is true of the English romantics too, they got more initially, you know, as kids, teenagers, they're all about the French Revolution and freedom, and they get a little older and come, become more conservative. Uh, not an uncommon story, uh, part of the human condition on some level. But um, at the same time, I, I don't think that Schelling, at least, Maybe Hegel's different, but uh, in terms of his understanding of the importance of the state, as Schelling ages, I think he has that same understanding that the state should ultimately, as a mechanism, is is an imposition on human freedom and should ultimately wither away. Um, Steiner is an anarchist, not one of these like tear down the system anarchists, but uh, an anarchist who would say um, similarly that we want to shrink the state as much as possible. It should be there. Government's role for Steiner is to protect the freedom of individuals, individual rights, and our responsibilities to one another as social beings. That's that's all the state should really be concerning itself with. Um, whereas the cultural sphere, which includes education and science and art, media, sports, uh, should be free of state control. It could be funded by taxes or what Steiner would call gift money, but the state shouldn't have control of curriculums, shouldn't have control of scientific research. And the economy should also be uh, more or less free from Steiner's point of view, but he would want the political sphere, the state to protect the rights of workers as individuals. And so he was totally, while he's not a materialist, he totally agreed with Marx's critique of capitalism and the exploitation of workers. He's totally on board with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Hitler had his eye on Steiner. And actually, I hate to quote Hitler, but he, in, a, in that newspaper article I mentioned, he says that Steiner's approach to the social problem and, and his 
proposal for reorganizing society in Central Europe was, I quote, a uniquely Jewish method of distorting people's natural state of mind, right? Steiner's not Jewish, but anything the Nazis don't like is Jewish. But um, so the fascists were not a fan of anthroposophy. Um, and it's true that when the Nazis came to power in the early 30s, there were some anthroposophists that adapted themselves to that situation and weren't vocal opponents. Uh, but other anthroposophists were shot in the street. And many Waldorf schools had to close because they wouldn't uh, agree to you know, the curricular restrictions that the Nazi party required. So it's a complicated story, but I think we need to be careful about repeating uh, in, in too easy a way this, this trope about romanticism necessarily being associated with fascism. I think it's more complex than that. Yeah. When we originally talked off of camera, um, you were talking to me, you actually brought up this idea that um, we should discuss anthropo anthroposophy's relation to German idealism uh, and romanticism as an extension. And I think maybe we've talked about this, but maybe we can go a little more in detail. So could you elaborate a little more um, on the connection between anthroposophy as a, an extension or even moving beyond idealism uh, and romanticism? Hmm. You know, when Schelling articulates his positive philosophy and really wants to yeah, develop, as you mentioned earlier, a metaphysical empiricism, uh, he says there that while, you know, Kant sort of started this with his transcendental aesthetic, we philosophy is still in desperate need of a critique of feeling. I think in some ways um, what Steiner is suggesting to us is uh, that we can that he's he's pursuing this 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 program that Schelling inaugurates you know a decade before he dies Schelling can't really take it up uh, his powers at that point were uh, I mean it's amazing what he articulates in the 1840s but he's an old man at this point Steiner is is picking up in some sense where Schelling and and Hegel uh, left off where you know they were pushing conceptual thinking as far as it could go and of course both had stuff to say about aesthetics and uh and the life of will but you know steiner is showing how if we can really balance these powers of our uh of our soul or what he would call the astral body thinking feeling and willing that we can push through just this merely conceptual way and you know Schelling wanted to go beyond just conceptual negative philosophy, right, into uh, a renewed understanding of our encounter with just the sheer fact that anything exists and the emotion of wonder that that uh, facticity provokes in us. And in some ways, Steiner wants us to go back to that original feeling and to, again, cultivate organs of perception, which would allow us to uh, penetrate into that feeling with more than just our sense-bound intellect, right? But to actually begin to participate in the unfolding of the imagination as an organ of perception, so that we and 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 for Steiner, the you know the the um, this act of self-positing that that Fichte discovers is kind of like a portal into the spiritual world. So the the ik is a uh, is the core of the human being, but it's also this doorway that opens out into the spiritual world. But the challenge that that Steiner encounters there, um, and he he warns his students about, is that when you enter that realm, it's very difficult initially to tell the difference between your own projections and the real the real imaginal world. Right. So usually imagination is just considered unreal fantasy. Um, but Steiner is saying, yes, initially, when we go through this portal of, of our own eye into the world of imagination, let's say, or the etheric uh, world, um, our own intentions and our own thinking activity creates the objects of our perception. It's a bit like what Kant said about the archetypal intellect. Uh, it's both 
it's it creates its own forms that it perceives right and so we need to develop a much greater degree of sensitivity to our own activity to be able to tell the difference between what we're creating and what we're perceiving in that world i mean this is true in our normal perception too but all the more so uh when we're trying to perceive the spiritual world and so you know one of the challenges of steiner is that he seems to have had these capacities far beyond what the average human being is capable of but he really wanted us to be able to test the claims he was making about that world and he provides exercises that he says uh can help you cultivate these experiences and they're simple memory exercises like uh without setting an alarm clock to remind yourself at the same time every day to perform a simple action uh like you know uh turning the paperweight on your desk in the opposite direction and gradually day after day after day what this does is it builds confidence in your own willing capacity and your own memory capacity to take an action which is totally not determined by anything in your environment right and you build a sense of confidence in your own willing capacity just by doing a simple action like that another one is that before bed he he suggests trying to remember the events of your day uh backwards from the moment just before getting into bed all the way till when you woke up that morning and again he thinks if you practice this day after day after day in a way it's preparation for dying because he would say after death you'll have a life review um and so you're preparing your soul for this while still alive and again it's strengthening your will it's strengthening your capacity to uh direct the the course of your own imagination right and that becomes very important for traveling through this portal into into the imaginal world and basically making good on the promise that Schelling makes for this new approach to philosophy positive philosophy in some sense you could say anthroposophy is what Schelling had in mind when he talks about positive philosophy right and Schelling's whole philosophy of mythology and revelation um similarly is is the seed for what Steiner does in books like Theosophy or Outline of Occult Science, where he talks about the angelic hierarchies, or we could say uh, in, engages in an anamnesis of the mythological process to see how uh, human consciousness came to be over the course of evolutionary history as a, uh, a process, not just of natural powers unfolding but of divine powers unfolding and so Schelling will say that you know the mythological process is in some some sense a recapitulation of uh the cosmic powers that you know uh, are manifest in the natural world and so Steiner's following through on these indications from Schelling in many ways um and you know this this view of his view of evolution might initially seems quite strange because he has a He's no longer separating mind from nature. He's no longer thinking of the human being as some kind of anomaly in the universe that accidentally emerges out of chemistry and physics and uh, totally non-teleological biological evolution. He's thinking of the human being like Goethe would as uh, a microcosm and as the human organism, as Goethe put it, as the most precise instrument for the study of nature that we could ask for. Right. And so when we think of the human being as integral to the, to the cosmos, our understanding of the evolutionary history of that cosmos is going to look very different um, because we're not just going to imagine that there ever was a time when it was just matter in motion. Um, that picture of the universe makes it highly improbable that human beings, conscious agents like us could ever emerge. Right. And so Steiner wants to say, in some sense, the human being has always been here in a different form. Right, and that we're caught up in this evolutionary process, and at this moment in our history, are called to take um, more conscious responsibility for the further evolution of our species and of the universe itself. Uh, and so, it's a, I think, inspiring, uh, adventurous picture of what it means to be a human being, and in many ways, yeah, continuous with the late Schelling and um carrying forward uh, a lot of the insights of the german idealists 
it's interesting that your answer, um, the first thing I thought of was when you speak about Whitehead and his process philosophy, or it might have been you that you thought that the next book that Whitehead mm. should have created was was called The Critique of Pure Feeling. So um I was I was listening as you were talking about feeling and sentiment and and going beyond the, the the sheer faculty and beyond this dualism of nature and mind, I kept thinking of of how you know connecting the dots from Tilhard de Chardin to to Whitehead to Steiner to Schelling to um, other thinkers that you listen to. So uh, you you sorry you read. Uh, so I could see a really nice map of you as a as a philosopher in your answer. So that's great. I have one last question, which is two parts, and then I'll let you go um, and enjoy your day. Um, so the first is, again, only because I, I know this text well, well, sort of well, um, how is Steiner's concept of freedom different than perhaps the German idealists, so Schelling and Hegel I'm thinking of? And I know in the philosophy of freedom, he talks a lot about Hegel. I think he mentions Schelling maybe once or twice, I'm not sure. Um, and the second part of it is for the viewers that are interested in Steiner who have never read him, what book would you recommend for them to start off with to read? So there you go. <laughs> mm. So I think there's there's something um, deeply convergent in how Steiner thinks about freedom and how Schelling articulates himself in his uh, philosophical investigations into the essence of human freedom, uh, that there's this decision which we make, which is prior to any sort of empirical choice. Uh, it's not the sort of superficial freedom that here in America, most people imagine when they hear that word. And even though in English, um, Steiner's book is sometimes translated as philosophy of freedom, uh, Freiheit in German means something different than what Americans hear when they hear freedom. Um, and so Steiner actually recommended an English title called uh, Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path or um, thinking as an intuitive activity, like these different names, because he didn't think that freedom resonated in the appropriate way to the, in the English ear uh, and the American ear, especially. And so, you know, rather than thinking of freedom in this cheap American sense of like, you know, having uh, 40 different brands of cereal to choose from at the grocery store uh, for Schelling and, and for Steiner and for, you know, all the idealists, I think freedom is more about uh, our character and, and this decision that occurs almost in eternity in a sense that shapes our character. And it's, it's like, to what extent can each of us alter our character? It's, it's like, well, it's, it happens. Like people do have these transformative experiences and it, it has to get at a, a layer deeper than our normal waking consciousness that really allows us to decide differently not how to be so much as who to be, <laughs> right? And this obviously um, can very easily become a kind of religious uh, question, uh, like a metanoia of sorts. And so, you know, freedom for Steiner is very much about this deeper level of character formation. Um, and it's how we create ourselves. And you know, Steiner would say that we, and this is where he goes, I think, a little bit uh, be beyond what Schelling or Hegel addressed. Um, but human beings have this uh, freedom in our thinking uh, that comes to us more easily than it does in our feeling and in our willing life. Steiner would say that we're most consciously awake in our thinking. We're kind of more or less dreaming in our feeling life and we're deeply asleep in our willing life. Um, and, you know, think of that, like our, the cravings and desires that we have and all the ways in which uh, we become addicted to different behaviors, different substances, uh, the ways in which we fall in love. Like you don't 
consciously decide on a lot of these things. That's our will life, you know? And we're a little bit more conscious in our feeling life, but still mostly dreamy. Um, and so the idea for Steiner is that we have this freedom of thought. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, we have the monkey mind and all of that, but it's easiest for human beings at this stage of our evolution to gain uh, freedom in our thinking. And we have to build on that and transform our feeling life and for Steiner, the ability to act with moral freedom very much depends on our ability to um, exercise what he would call moral imagination, where we can picture the action we'd like to take and feel love ultimately for that action, which would then translate into the will that actually does it, <laughs> right? And And gradually by bringing the freedom of our thinking into the work of transforming our feeling, we can transform our willing, right? And begin to integrate and bring more wakefulness to these different levels of our soul life. And uh, I think he offers us more of a practical program with exercises. I just named a few of them earlier, uh, whereby we might come to do this. And you know, you don't get very much in the way of meditative exercises from Schelling or Hegel, maybe a little bit in Fichte, but uh, it's kind of just like stare at the wall, you know, not see yourself seeing the wall. And so there's a little bit of that in Fichte, like this demonstration of, of the conceptual activity he's trying to illustrate for us, but it's minimal, you know, and Steiner's, I think, trying to do something more like, um, yeah, uh, providing a spiritual practice to go along with these beautiful thoughts. So that was a wonderful answer yet again. Um, you have been doing such a great job of navigating us through this uh, very wonderful and complex uh, and deep uh, thinker. So for those that are not well-versed in Steiner's philosophy, mm. where do you think- um, Where should they start reading? Yeah, where should they start reading? Well, for those who have a background in German idealism, I would say, the philosophy of freedom uh, is probably a good place to start because it it really does try to lead you in a kind of phenomenological way to this basically uh, Fichtean insight of the way in which your own thinking activity, in your own thinking activity, you're already a spiritual being and already living in the spiritual world. Um, he kind of, it's I don't want to say he tricks you, but he almost um, surprises you it, let's say you come to the book as a materialist and you're following his train of thought and like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. And then all of a sudden you realize that he's just talked you into believing in the spiritual world. <laughs> um, and so that book is probably a good place to start. I would also say another option would be some of his early work on, on Goethe. Um, he's, there's a number of different English translations that collect his introductions to uh, Goethe's scientific works, and he lays out his methodology. And uh, it might be for those who are less philosophically inclined and haven't studied the idealists, because you're right, he's citing uh, all the German idealists in the philosophy of freedom and thinking with them um, quite closely. Whereas in the works on Goethe, he's he's more, uh, you know, talking about the natural sciences in an accessible way. Um, and then for those who really want to go deeper, he's got a wonderful history of philosophy that he wrote called the riddles of philosophy, where he goes all the way back to, uh, the pre-Socratics, uh, the physiologoi, um, and he, he, he actually dwells, most histories of philosophy start with Thales. He starts with Pherakides, um, this, uh, even earlier thinker who's, I guess usually not included in histories of philosophy because he's still a bit mythological, but he's starting to already develop a more conceptual way of thinking. So he starts with Pherakides and goes all the way through uh, pragmatism, really, and 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 James in the early 20th century, and he gives the history of philosophy as an evolution of consciousness, right? And so it's not overly um, spiritual. He's not so much talking about the theoric and astral bodies and angelic hierarchies. He's just talking about the process unfolding 
in human heads and human hearts over the course of this history of philosophy and really what philosophy is about for him, which is, you know, primarily the emergence of the I, uh, you know, as, as Fichte would describe it. Uh, so riddles of philosophy would be another good place to start. Well, it's, it's been an hour and it's went by like this because this has been a real treat. Um, I think you did such a great job, very passionately explaining and disclosing this very complex thinker for all of us. And you kind of won me over on this one too. So maybe I'll pick up some more Steiner and read him. Uh, so I want to thank you so much for being here and for part participating in this series and being a part of it as well too. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for, for the opportunity and for all the great work that you're doing. All right, take care, Matt.